Okay, we're going to talk about the kids, my, my two children, James Edward Anderson and Catherine Louise. Uh, if there's one thing I'm proud of, it's my kids. <laughs> um, of course, Jim came first, and uh, the story on Jim is that he's named after two of my squadron mates that were killed in World War II. Jim Browning flew with me from the very beginning and uh, was, a, was a great guy. Uh, he was kind of a, he was the kind of a guy who went to town <laughs> more than the rest of them. Uh, but he was a good pilot and uh, aggressive and, and uh, one of the guys I liked. Uh, it's tragic. He uh, he did a second tour, and I think he had something like seven victories. And in the late, early '45, before the war ended, he 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 came back for a second tour, <coughs> and he came back for a second tour. And he and Don Baquet were together, and they got into a um, dogfight with some uh, uh, German 262 jets. And the one that uh, uh, Jim was engaging was, uh, as we found out later, a, a German, a Baron. Uh, he was a group commander. And they got into a turning dogfight, which is not a smart thing for a ME-262 to do, uh, but the guys separated out and then came back, and they were playing chicken, and they head on, and both of them were vaporized. He was missing for a great number of years, and I was amazed at the, uh, how the um, Army um, I uh, forget what they call them, the guys that go f searching for um, missing, missing people. Uh, there was a file on him that thick of, of uh, studying German recordings on their uh, interceptor uh, networks and uh, interviews with people on the ground and all that. They found the wreckage, but um, no body parts from either one of them. So he was missing for a great number of years. Then the other one is even a more tragic uh, story. Uh, well, they're both tragic. Uh, uh, Ed, Eddie Simpson. Uh, he flew my wing early and then later became a flight leader. And I think he had uh, five or six kills and was a flight leader. And uh, he, was, he was the kind of guy that, uh, 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 he, was, he, was a, he was, he was just a great guy. Good pilot, hangs in there like, you know, just like glue on your wing. But he was so good and we needed other people, so he became a flight leader himself uh, almost, uh, very soon. And the story on him is um, he, um, he's one of these guys that would say, uh, uh, let's, let's go to London next, next weekend. And then there would be missions coming up and I'd schedule them right up to Friday. <laughs> and he said, why don't we skip this one? And go, so we could be sure we're gonna go to London. And he says, when I come back, I'll follow you into hell and back if, if you want. <laughs> but let's skip this one. <laughs> uh, but uh, he was courageous and, and uh, he was the kind of guy you wanted with you all the time in a fight or anything. But when I left uh, for my, after my uh, first tour, I came home on an R&R &R for 30 days. He, he hadn't finished his tour course and uh, by the way, I was the first guy in, of all the original pilots in the 357th fighter group to complete a tour. Uh, he, uh, he was there and um, 
there was a mission going to Russia, the, sh the shuttle raids where they went to Russia, bombed on the way to Russia, then they went to bombed and then went to Italy and then the bombed and went to back to England, a, a, a triangle thing. They tried it, I think, three times. It was a disaster, but um, uh, it was something they tried, trying to uh, work with our allies, you know, the Russians. The Russians didn't want us in there, and uh, it, was, it, was, it just wasn't a way to do it. But anyway, he looked at the Russian mission, and he calculated how many hours he would fly, and he would overfly his tour. So he says, no, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay here and finish my tour and go home and stay home. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the group went on to, to um, uh, on that mission. In the meantime, there was, there was airplanes behind and they used them uh, sparingly. And he was on a mission over uh, in France. Now this is after D-Day and, uh, and uh, it's over uh, potentially occupied country, uh, reoccupied by the French. And he took a brand new wingman with him and uh, the wingman ran into him. They had a mid-air. The wingman didn't survive, but uh, Eddie got out of the airplane and parachuted down into uh, France. Uh, he was uh, picked up with the um, by the uh, French underground, the Maki, and apparently there was a, a large group of them, and they also had some other Allied flyers with them, and they were going to have a ceremony out in the out in the forest, some remote place. Uh, for um, honoring some of their their um, countrymen that were killed and bury them. So they had quite a gathering out there. Somehow or other, the Germans got word of it. And uh, we learned this, we learned this all much later. Um, they sent a, um, a combat unit out to uh, capture them. And they saw him coming, and they all scrambled and got in their trucks and left. And Eddie and a, uh, uh, a, a Frenchman, uh, probably someone he didn't even know, jumped in the last truck and started out. And then they jumped out with the machine guns and laid in the road, just like the damn movies and stopped the first two or three cars and allowed everybody to escape. And uh, they were both killed. So those are the two guys I named uh, my son after, James Edward Anderson. And of course, Jim was, uh, was a great guy. Uh, I'm proud of my kids. They're, they're, they were, I, I don't remember having a problem with my kids. Uh, they probably had a problem with me, but uh, <laughs> we're talking about Jim, uh, my son. And uh, uh, every once in a while I'd ask him if he was interested in flying or the military or things like that. And no, no, he didn't want to do anything like that. Uh, uh, of course, we moved around from base to base, and you know he was familiar with the military, and uh, uh, didn't seem much interested in it. And so, you know, I quit asking him. You got to want to do what you what what you what you want to do. Uh, so he and his buddy came to me in their senior year in high school and said, "Hey." Ron and I want to go to uh, the Air Force Academy. Can you help us? I said, yeah, I could have a year ago. So they've already been selected. They selected them in their junior year. And they both were pretty downtrodden about it. And uh, so uh, the first thing I wanted to do was make sure he was um, physically fit. So I had the flight surgeon give him a flight physical. And of course he was fine. And uh, 
So what we decided, we, we uh, looked into other things and uh, he went off to a prep school, which probably helped him go, uh, good on to do on the entrance exams and things. And then his buddy went to the uh, Air Force, uh, uh, the academy uh, prep school right there on the grounds. It's, uh, it's quite a deal. Uh, a lot of the athletes go there. And that's where all the appointments from the services, from the ranks come from, from that prep school probably. Uh, shorten up the story, they both got into the, uh, got in, got an appointment. Appointment's a big problem. And actually, um, local politicians um, helped me on that. They both went to the academy. They both graduated in um, uh, class 69. And then Jim put in 20 years. And then uh, he went to the airlines. Uh, he, he had impeccable timing. If he'd have stayed in, he probably would have been fine. Uh, the Cold War was still going on. <clears throat> but he went with Southwest Airlines, and um, they were just about to sprout. And so he spent most of his time as a captain. And he put in uh, 16 years with them and then got aged out at 60. And we'll tell a story about Vietnam later. And my daughter, um, she came along second, and um, she's always been a, a great gal. She... Uh, we got her off to college, and um, and she got a teacher's um, teacher credentials. And then she met Bill in uh, uh, in college, uh, Bill Burlington. They got married pretty soon after um, after college, and uh, have raised a, a very fine family, two girls. Uh, and the two girls, the girl, one, one daughter, one granddaughter has twin boys and uh, the other one has a, a little girl, little Ellie, named after my wife, great, great granddaughter. And, and my later years here, uh, both kids have been very supportive, of course, with Elner in the nursing home. Kitty comes all the way from North Carolina about every three months to visit her mom and, and me. Jim and Dad flying a combat mission in Vietnam. Uh, when Jim uh, when Jim got out of the academy in 1969, well, he got married immediately. <laughs> They had a big, big uh, wedding in the in the Air Force uh, chapel with the swords and the whole works. He went right off to flying school, and then uh, he, uh, he, out of all the assignments he could go, the the, the one he picked was uh, Vietnam. So he'd go immediately to a combat unit, and he went to a special. Special Special Operations Squadron in, in Benoit uh, operated the uh, O2s, the um, Cessna 337 push-pull thing. And they had a variety of missions uh, to, to do. Uh, uh, and and uh, I'll describe one of them later. So uh, meanwhile, of course, I'm still in the Air Force and I'm a bird colonel and he's a second lieutenant now, and he's got his pilot wings, and he's off to Vietnam. And at this point, um, I followed him to Vietnam, uh, to the Southeast Asia. I actually was stationed in Thailand at uh, Tak Lee, uh, commander of the 355th TAC fighter wing, flying F-105s late in the war. When Jim was in the Air Force Academy, I was, um, I was at uh, Kadena Air Base in uh, Okinawa. I was uh, either their director of operations or the vice commander of the wing. I might have been the commander at the time. Uh, I can't remember what, I'd have to figure out the dates. But um, 
uh, Jim was in the academy, and uh, on his first summer, uh, no, I guess it was his second summer. On his first summer, he went to jump school, and he got jump wings. <laughs> I think he wanted to get something his dad didn't have. Uh, so um, on his second summer, he came to Okinawa. Uh, um, uh, and uh, while he was there, uh, of course, I had him visit all of our squadrons and things like that. And, then I took him for a ride in a F-105, a two-place F-105, and uh, we took it just barely supersonic, so he could say he's been supersonic, and, and uh, we had a lot of fun flying, come back down and got a lot of photos, gave him a little certificate, you know, that he'd flown in the, in the Thunder Chief, and uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty special. We we're talking about the story of how uh, uh, dad and uh, and d d uh, father and son flew a combat mission in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I was in Takli, commander of the 355th TAC fighter wing, and uh, I got notification that I had to go to Tonsonut to uh, 7th, 7th Air Force headquarters for a conference of all wing commanders and. Um, in Southeast Asia. So I, uh, Jim had been over there several months now, and I, and I had only been there a couple of months. And so I thought, well, this is a good time for me to visit him. And uh, so I gave him a call and uh, told him what, my, what I was gonna do. And he says to me, he says, hey, how would you like to go on a mission with me? And I thought about that a little bit, and I said, you know, that would be great. <laughs> but how the hell is he going to pull this off? You know, he's a second lieutenant, a new guy in the outfit. And uh, and me being a commander, if I if I knew so, somebody wanted to fly with their son in my outfit, it would be hell no. Not only no, but hell no. So he says, stand by. So I'm hanging on the phone. He goes off and he comes back a little bit and he says, okay, it's all set. He says, you come in uh, two days early, uh, go to Tonsonut, and he says, I'll come over and pick you up in an O2 and we'll fly a mission. We'll land back at Benoit, you spend the night with me and then I'll fly you back over to your, your uh, Tonsonut for your conference. Well, that sounded pretty great, so I fly on down there, and uh, next morning I go to base operations, and he comes up in his O2, and we jump in it, and then he briefs me on the way what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go out on a propaganda mission uh, and a leaflet-dropping mission. So he said, what we're going to do, showed me on the map, we go over here, and you fly over a communist stronghold, and uh, they had uh, speakers out on the wingtips of the uh, little O2. And then you um, turn on the, the recorder, or, or I mean the uh, radio, and, and broadcast propaganda. Then you come back across and drop leaflets out, surrender leaflets or safe passage uh, leaflets. And then we had we had two or three places to do that, and he said uh, these are not uh, we we don't expect any heavy they don't go where heavy arms are they they'll go where they got AK forty sevens and stuff like that, so they know just where to fly just out of range, and they zigzag and, and figure eight around and then you come back and you make a big pass across the thing. So we're flying along, and uh, now normally, uh, in this con in this situation, you've got an aircraft commander, and in this case, it's a second lieutenant. And normally, the second crew member is, say, um, a buck sergeant, a three striper. 
And uh, the three striper is just to turn the radios on and all that. And then when it comes time for the uh, leaflets, he has to get out of the seat and get around and throw them out the back. They have a little little doors in the back. But here in this case, you got a second lieutenant and you got a bird colonel as the kicker. <laughs> so we go out there and uh, we start circling and we're broadcasting all this gibbering. And uh, he says, okay, Dad, uh, get in the back and uh, we're gonna dump out the leaflets. So I was in a flying suit that had the zippers like this here. And so I always carried a, um, a little stainless steel pocket knife, one of my favorite things, and had my name engraved on it. And I always carried it right in here. So I unzipped that and took my knife out and opened up the boxes. And uh, he says, okay, drop them now. And I lean out like this to drop the, drop the leaflets out. And out of my pocket goes whoosh, my, my, my favorite knife down there in the jungle. That's my contribution to the mission. <laughs> then we were flying around and uh, I remember we got a call from an army unit on the radio uh, and they were lost. These guys were lost and they were looking for a helicopter landing zone, a just thick jungle. But uh, they would they would blow away the uh, jungle and, you know, put a nice circle in there for them to land. Said, we're looking for LZ so-and-so, and I gave the coordinates, and Jim looks it up in the map, and of course they could hear us circling, so they knew we were near him. And he's found it. He says, okay, shoot up a, shoot up a flare. And they fired one up through the, up through the, the, the canopies there, and we could spot him. And he says, oh yeah, you're, you're so many meters, so-and-so. <laughs> they were very close but they couldn't find it. It's kind of amazing. So we go back and land and uh, debrief and got some pictures and I spent the night with him and then he got me over to the thing in the morning. Now, words can't, I can't figure out words to express the feelings of being able to have done that. You know, father, son, fly a combat mission together. Ellie, my spouse, we're on our 68th year now. She's got some words to say about it. <laughs> she says she's damn glad she didn't know about it until it was over. Before I left the United States for, um, uh, for Southeast Asia, I knew I was within two years of mandatory retirement. And so I'm thinking, you know, what do I want to do? And I'm going to be 50. And I was, I would say, I was almost embarrassed to think that I was going to retire. And I wanted to be productive and I, I wanted to do something. So I, uh, I knew that the F-15 Eagle was the program, the test program would be just about starting in summer of 72. And I had been familiar with it, uh, generating the requirements of it for it when I was in the Pentagon. And it seemed like the best thing we uh, we'd, were, we were gonna develop uh, in a long time. And I was fascinated with that. And I'd seen all the aircraft companies, you know, being working in flight tests. And um, I was impressed with the McDonald Company. Uh, I had worked with North American, Republic, uh, Lockheed, all of them. And so uh, I had some friends there uh, and talked about, you know, possibly where could I fit into uh, uh, their test organization. Not necessarily as flying because I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be 50 years old, uh, which doesn't mean that t test pilots don't fly after 50, but uh, they probably don't hire them at 50. So I was looking for anything I could do, and they said, "Yeah, we we uh, 
we're going to expand our um, presence at Edwards Air Force Base, and uh, uh, you would fit in perfectly into into this kind of a situation. So uh, when I um, came back from Vietnam, I had um, less than two years to go. And you can go, you can pick your base, you can pick it. And uh, you don't count on uh, the commander's records there because you're, you're kind of dead wood. So I, I had written to uh, Bob White, who was the commander at Edwards, uh, thinking I might go there. And he got back to me and he says, sure, come on, we'll figure out a place for you. And then also, I wanted to. I thought about coming to um, near Sacramento, so I'd be near Auburn. And uh, uh, Ellie was there, was there waiting for me, and that we would um, see if we wanted to live in Auburn after our retirement sometime. And I knew the commander there, and uh, when he got my request, uh, he just put in a name request for me. He didn't even answer my letter, and I got orders to come to McClellan for my terminal assignment. Put in a year and a half there, and then I uh, retired, and immediately we moved to Lancaster, California, and uh, where I had the job of assistant um, facility manager. We had a flight test facility at Edwards for the McDonald Company. Uh, all the contractors at some time have a facility there to do their flight test. It's such a wonderful place to do flight testing. You've got that big lake bed there, and it's a, it's a great place in an emergency. You know, there's flying, and then there's flying. <laughs> uh, some people fly as a professional thing, just, you know, it's, it's a work, it's a job. But um, other people, I'm one of them, that flies because of a passion, a passion for it. And I have no idea where it came from. You know, it, it's, it goes back to my youth when the airplanes just used to fly by here and I'd rush out in the yard and look up at them and, and just was fascinated by it. Then it just, it became a passion. Yeah, I got my private pilot's license in the spring of 1941. When I, when I got out of the, uh, when I got out of the Air Force and I went to work for the McDonald Company, I thought I was gonna quit flying. And, and this will give you some idea about passion. Um, I, um, thought I'll go cold turkey. I will not fly. I've done the best. I've had all the best kind of airplanes and I've done all the things that people want to do in airplanes and uh, it's all over. I just quit. After I retired and went to um, uh, Lancaster and started working for McDonald, uh, I was seeing all these airplanes flying around at Edwards and everything and it, it, it it just, I just couldn't quit. And I decided, hey, I gotta, I gotta start flying again. So I went out to the local Flock Field there and got checked out in a, a little Grumman Tiger or some, something like that and started flying. And then I thought, oh man, you know, if I'm gonna do this, um, uh, I gotta do it right. So I still had some GI Bill rights. So I said, I'm gonna use up those and get myself a flight instructor rating in airplanes and instruments and, uh, and the whole works. So uh, I actually went to Van Nuys Airport down in uh, LA Basin and uh, driving back and forth uh, on my time off. And I got a, I got a, a certified flight instructor rating uh, for air, airplane, single engine. And then I got my instrument uh, um, instrument uh, rating too. Then I really got the bug. I thought, man, uh, I, I, 
I bought an airplane. And nobody ever buys a new airplane. You always buy an old one. But I bought a brand new Piper 160 horse uh, Cherokee. And there was uh, uh, rationalization going on in my head. Uh, <laughs> uh, Ellie's mother was pretty sick about that time. She was, um, we were afraid she was going to pass away. And Edwards is about 400 and something miles from uh, Auburn. And so Ellie was spending a lot of time in Auburn, you know, driving back and forth. And uh, I said, well, if I get this airplane, I could fly you up there on Friday afternoon and we could come back Sunday evening and you could go up there more. And so she was all for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, uh, I, I de finally decided to um, put it on, rent, on uh, a leaseback for financial reasons. And so I gave it to an FBO at uh, Fox Field and let them have it for a while. After a while, I moved it up to Auburn when I knew I was going to come up here. And then I eventually sold it. Um, after its first big overall. <laughs> that was sticker shock. <laughs> but but getting back to flying, um, I don't know, it's, it's uh, 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 some of the things I've done, you know, in flying. When you went from slow airplanes, uh, Piper Cubs, to um, airplanes capable of two times the speed of sound, and you have this tremendous power where you can, uh, <laughs> you know, like the like the poem, you can wheel and soar. <laughs> you can really do it in some of the uh, military jets that we had. And nowadays, it's even greater. You know, the the uh, the, the current generation of fighters can climb, uh, ac accelerate, and while they're climbing and pulling G's and tax the human body. But uh, uh, just all oh, the things that you could do with that kind of thing of on a nice cloudy day, is, you know, playing in the clouds and uh, uh, just an incredible feeling. And the sights you see, you know, from, uh, from high altitude at night, uh, I don't know, it's just um, Flying is just an incredible thing. I've, I've never grown bored, bored of it. Um, I still love to fly today. But I did decide at age 90 that I'd probably not renew my um, flight medical. I kept up my flight instructor rating, and I can legally give instruction if you're current and you have a medical and stuff like that. And I can ride with somebody or an instructor.
Yeah, I'm Colonel Bud Anderson, and I'm going to do a, you might say, a walk around on a P-51B Bravo airplane. Uh, this particular airplane right here is painted exactly like my airplane was painted in World War II. It's been restored by Jack Roush, and he's done a marvelous job of uh, restoring it. And one of the main features, of course, is the uh, Malcolm Hood, which is quite a quite a modification on the uh, on the P-51Bs and, and, uh, and Cs. Bs and Cs had uh, what we call a birdcage canopy, and you opened it like this over the top like that, and of course it had slats on the thing, and of course when you're looking out, uh, the damn slat is right there by your eye, and so these were marvelous improvement. Uh, for a pilot to uh, look around in aerial combat. Well, when you did a walk around in the morning, he usually uh, came out from operations and walked out to your airplane. Your crew chief would meet you uh, somewhere in the area. And then you'd go over the paperwork and sign the Form 1A, the um, uh, maintenance records on the airplane that, uh, uh, that, that, the, that the military kept at the time. Uh, and discuss anything about the airplane if you wanted. Of course, this was my own personal airplane, and I knew it very well. And uh, and I had a, a wonderful uh, crew, a ground crew. Uh, I flew all of my combat missions, 116, with uh, 480 hours and 20 minutes of combat flying without a single abort for any reason whatsoever. That's pretty remarkable, actually. Have it, having said uh, what my uh, combat record was, uh, 116 missions without an abort, uh, leads me to my, uh, my crew chief story, which I like to tell um, whenever I can. Uh, you know, I think you could imagine yourself being a, a crew chief of, a, of an airplane, World War II. Your pilot's doing the fighting and the dying, and uh, you're back here maintaining that airplane. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, if you're the crew chief, that's your airplane. And you're, you're a part of it. And when that guy gets a kill and puts it up in here, that's your kill too. The guys were very, uh, uh, very supportive and wanted to do their part. Uh, uh, just uh, incredible. And the story I like to tell, uh, my crew chief story, is about uh, my second tour when I uh, I had a, uh, a P-51 uh, D dog, the classic model over here. And it was camouflaged in this uh, dark green camo, completely, just about like this airplane here. And uh, it was my second tour, and Otto, Otto Heino had been uh, promoted to tech sergeant, and uh, crew chiefs were staff sergeant. So uh, he had a flight of uh, six airplanes to oversee. And so he handpicked a new crew chief for me, Mel Schooneman. And then, of course, the third member of my, my crew was uh, Leon Zimmerman, who was my armor. Uh, all three of those guys were, those were my crews uh, during World War II and also during my P-39 training. So uh, as the story goes in uh, my second tour, uh, I have the, the completely camouflaged uh, D, and uh, I think it was in November of uh, 1944. I remember it was uh, snowing over Germany, and it said snow had hit the night before, and I mean a big time snow, and all of northern Germany and northern Europe was, uh, was uh, in dense snow. And I looked down, we used to fly in the Finger, fingertip four, uh, a leader and a wingman and a, a uh, element leader and a wingman. And I looked down against the, um, here's, a, here's a nice white surface right here with the f f flying on four. And at this point of time, 
uh, we weren't paying too much attention to the uh, paint schemes. And we had all green ones, we had all silver ones, we had uh, some that were in half, half camo and half silver. And I'm looking down at this snow and which one stood out? Well, of course, the dark ones stood out. The camouflaged airplanes stood out. So I, I made a mental note to talk to my crew when I got back to um, after the mission. When I landed, I uh, got them together and I said, you know, uh, it's snowing over there and I'm going to finish my tour in the winter. Uh, whenever this thing is laid up for heavy maintenance, would you please depaint it, take the the um, the camo off of it and make it a silver paint scheme. And I put it to them on a, uh, on a base, tactical basis that it might save my butt. Uh, but frankly, uh, you know, I had another reason. Uh, that was one reason, but I kind of thought the, uh, the all silver airplanes looked a little cooler than the all combo airplanes. So. I told them that and I thought it would take, uh, you know, two or three days to do that. And I did tell them when it's laid up for heavy maintenance, please repaint the airplane. So uh, I went in and uh, I was the operations officer and I decided that I wanted to fly the next day, put my name on the board and went home and forgot about it. Next morning after uh, breakfast and getting the briefing come out, I grabbed my chute in operations and I walked out to my revetment. I'm the closest, my, my revetment was uh, easy walking distance from operation. I had my parachute over my shoulder and I climb up over the revetment and I'm standing there looking down and here's my, my Mustang sitting there in gleaming aluminum. And I was really quite flabbergasted, you know, I thought, wow, did those guys think I gave them a direct order to do that and then i looked at them closely and i noticed their hands were uh, were raw you know the skin had been pushed off of them and, and they'd been rubbing and rubbing and a little bit of blood on them and that made me feel uh really uh <laughs> made it feel like hell i said i wonder did these guys think i gave them a direct order to to paint that thing right there and then I thought about it a little bit, and I said, no, you know, they wanted to do that. That was their contribution to the war, and uh, they, they wanted to just please me uh, however they could. And I just can't say enough about the crew chiefs of the world. <laughs> So uh, after you uh, finish your paperwork and discussion with the crew chief, uh, they always had the airplanes just absolutely perfect and ready to go. And uh, uh, there wasn't much sense of uh, doing a walk around, but that's required. So we did a cursory walk around uh, to comply with the rules. The uh, pilot will do a walk around. So, you walk around the airplane and just kind of checking. Here you want to make sure the gas caps are closed. The gun bay doors are down tight and smooth. Come over here, check the ailerons, see the tabs hooked together. Come along here, look on the wing tip. See if you don't, make sure you don't have any busted lights. Uh, this one doesn't have them all. And it has an extra light. We didn't have that one. And then you got over here, check your leading edge just so it's small, smooth, landing light, make sure it's not cracked and on. Then we got here, uh, we would have a big um, uh, 108 gallon of, uh, fuel tank. It was just round, cylinder round and round on the end. And they were made out of uh, pressed paper and resin and uh, we did that so that we wouldn't drop aluminum tanks over Germany and give them uh, aluminum to help manufacture airplanes. They were very successful, uh, but you had to get rid of them as soon as they were empty, or if you got into combat, of course, you jettisoned them immediately. 
because they were a lot of extra drag and they would not stand a lot of airspeed. I can't remember what it was, but after a certain airspeed, they would shred. So, and uh, we did carry bombs uh, uh, briefly for about 30 days uh, after the uh, Normandy beachhead landing. Okay, check your bomb. Uh, you check the guns, and this is a, there's a difference on the B and the D, of course. Uh, the B model only had two guns, but they were also mounted differently. Um, there's, there's several production changes this in, in the, between the B and the D, but one of them, they, these guns are, are laying in here sideways, and I don't know which way they lay. Yeah, probably this way. And so the, the ammo doesn't feed in there directly like that. It feeds at an angle. And so we were having gun jams um, when you were pulling G's and firing. The guns would jam and you had no way of uh, recharging them and all that. And we finally got that ironed out by having very clean uh, working guns and then putting uh, trays on top of the ammo so it wouldn't flop around. But when you're doing a walk around, you just check and make sure. They usually had tape over the things like that. You come around and check your tires. You know, the old saying, you fighter pilots come around and kick their tires. <laughs> but you just want to make sure that the tire was inflated. And you check uh, a lot of the things like that. Come under here and uh, check the... Uh, check any loose lines and stuff like that. These doors are uh, uh, hydraulically operated and we have the hydraulic pressure has been broken on them. So you can actually move them up and down. You wanna take a look at the radiator while you're under there and make sure there's no birds in there or stuff like that. Rabbits and, <laughs> and other kind of animals. <laughs> And then uh, we'll come around and uh, check the props. There, these would all these would be removed, and there isn't much you can check. Uh, you're you're looking for uh, zeuses that are not tight, stuff like that. Check the propeller just for a, a smoothness, and you'd want to be sure that this thing was out. And uh, again, you check your. Uh, uh, check the main, uh, main, main and you come around on this side, and do the same. You get in here and you look around for loose, loose uh, lines, um, anything that doesn't look there. Oh yeah, and on the landing gear, you want to be sure that this thing isn't flat. It has a certain. You want to make sure there's a gap here on the. Uh, on the oleo strut so that it's not down here flat or it's not stuck way up here and the airplane would be cocked sideways like that uh not much else you can check just to make sure you know it's everything's working again the guns the same thing uh again on this side you you would check your tank and just make sure it's hooked up properly and and uh, look for any visual reference of a problem and on this side if uh, if you had a, a pedo pedo head to cover on it it would be removed your crew chief would remove it but if it wasn't you want to be sure and take that off because it will interfere with the uh, airspeed uh, indications properly smooth leading edge come on out here same thing check all this going back you get on the trim tab again, flaps, and again, you want to make sure all these doors and all these things are attached. And in particular, he wanted that to be sealed properly. And uh, come down in here. Now, when you come by the radiator, uh, the thing that I always look for when I first walk up on the airplane is to make sure that this... Uh, scoop is in what we call the open position that's that's manually wide open and so you knew that the controls are set properly but we always double checked them
Uh, this is a tie down hole that goes through there. Just make sure that the airplane isn't been tied isn't tied down. Come around here, leading in. Uh, the uh, B models that we had, the Bs and the Cs, uh, did not have this strake on it. Uh, they came right down here like that to the wing, and the, these are uh, these were a field mod. They came on some of the late production airplanes, but they were added uh, afterwards. Uh, Jack had a standard uh, tail and decided to add this uh, ventral to improve the directional uh, flying qualities of the airplane. You got the leading edge, counterbalance. All you're doing is just checking for, see that everything is here. Uh, trim tab, come around here. Here's the rudder tab and the rudder. And then you come around this side, same stuff. Check the wing, back and forth. And then uh, you're back here. You want to just check your tailwheel, make sure it's inflated properly, and the doors are unobstructed. And again, here's what we check. You make sure that that thing is wide open. That's real important. Then the last thing on this side, you have the fuselage tank. Uh, thing. You want to make sure it's closed and sealed properly. Okay, from uh, this point you would uh, gather up your parachute. Uh, you might even be wearing it, be a back, sh back chute. And you uh, mount the airplane from this side, or you could come up the uh, strut on the front, and then uh, we'll go get in the cockpit, and I'll give you a kind of a run, a run around the cockpit, showing uh, where all the switches are and things like that. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. 
Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, Thank you for watching.